start, since I don't in fact recognize uh, the names of the people attending tonight. Uh, perhaps I should start, well, first of all, by saying a very warm welcome from me based in London. Uh, I'll say a little word, if I may, by way of introduction about the Insiders Outsiders project, as Ron himself knows. Um, I'm a London-based art historian and the founding director of a project called Insiders Outsiders, subtitled Refugees from Nazi Europe and their contribution to British culture, which took the form of a year-long nationwide in-person, this is pre-COVID, of course, um, uh, festival that really exceeded my wildest expectations, though I say it myself, um, aroused a great deal of interest in this country from all sorts of unexpected quarters, which was very gratifying. And then, of course, so it did strike and the obvious thing to do was to go online. So this event tonight, which I very much look forward to, is part of this ongoing series of virtual events, better than nothing for sure, which has uh, been taking place really since since um, early 2020 and has given the festival a very rich afterlife. And if you'd like to know more about what we get up to, then do sign up to the newsletter, the sort of bottom right of every page of the Insiders Outsiders Festival.org website and you will you will be kept informed um fine i'm just looking uh at who's coming in we'll carry on um good well there's been quite a long break over the summer months for various practical reasons and it's my very great pleasure that it's ron talking about his uncle heinz or henry inlander as our first event of the autumn season um let me start then by well you know the practicalities by now if you wouldn't mind making sure that um you're on mute uh, there will be an opportunity for a q and a and discussion afterwards we'll come to that uh later let me start then by saying a few words i think ron you've said that many of these people are familiar to you but nevertheless <laughs> i will introduce you uh more or less formally uh as mentioned, he's the artist in question's nephew, which gives him a very privileged position, but also, as you will already know, perhaps, and so certainly soon discover, he is eminently qualified to be thinking, talking, writing about art. Born in London, but came as a child to, to Canada, has been the president and the vice chancellor of Emily Carr, University of Art and Design in Vancouver, many, many, many miles from London, but... God bless Zoom, what a wonderful thing it is. Um, he's currently a president emeritus. He's a recipient of Canada's highest civ civilian award, the Order of Canada, as well as the Order of British Columbia, and has been recognized with a knighthood also by the French government. Uh, he's also been the director of the graduate program at McGill University in, uh, in Montreal, and the author of five books. All of them sound thoroughly intriguing, Ron. Um, I'll just mention one or two, How Images Think, Cultures of Vision, Images, Media and the Imaginary, and um, earlier on, ex Explorations in Film Theory. And he's just told me that there's a new book in the pipeline to be published in the spring of next year with another wonderfully, you know, I think ambitious and intriguing title, A Biography of Learning. So I think without further ado, Ron, I will hand over to you to share screen and to introduce us to this wonderful painter. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is I'll actually share the screen right away so that we can get the image up, uh, just so I don't want to uh, encounter any technical challenges here. Okay, so um, I, I, I thank you very much, Monica, and thank you for the work that you're doing in this area. Monica and I were chatting uh, beforehand uh, just about the challenge uh, for families uh, that have experienced what I'll describe uh, to you. And many of you know what happened uh, uh, to, uh, you know, many different families, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. Uh, so, so a lot of this will appear to be the same uh, or the story will appear to be familiar. But the reality is that um, uh, this one is a little bit more nuanced and quite different, uh, simply because uh, it, it is a painter and a painter who struggled with the question of how to actually uh, not only depict, but in, internalize and externalize the vision that he had about uh, the trauma that he experienced uh, uh, in uh, world, through, throughout the period of World War II, but uh, before it and afterwards. Um, so just very briefly, uh, Heinz, who became Henry in, in England, um, was, uh, was my uncle and my father's brother. And uh, I will give you, I will go through some details in the slides uh, about what happened to them uh, pre-war, post-war, and then uh, I'll actually get into more detail about the paintings, some of the paintings themselves. So let me just get this uh, going here. So, um, 
the interesting thing about uh, about Heinz was that he rarely wrote anything. And when he wrote things, he wrote things in a very helter-skelter kind of way. So when we, uh, my, my wife and I first uh, actually began to uh, look at the material that was available about Heinz uh, and the material that his uh, wife had left behind after she died in 2014, uh, we, we found pieces of paper, scraps everywhere, uh, and uh, it was very, very tough uh, to actually uh, figure out uh, any kind of detail, any kind of continuum, any kind of consistency. But one of the things that we found was this note, uh, sort of close to this extraordinary portrait. Now, this is a portrait of uh, a woman from Antigone Corrado, and I will talk about Antigone. And if I, for some reason, if I don't provide you with enough details about Antigone, just ask me a question afterwards. And by the way, ask me a question anytime through the presentation, interrupt me uh, if I'm being unclear or if I'm not actually expressing uh, with clarity uh, what I'm trying to get at. So uh, this uh, this portrait is typical. He, he, he worked on portraiture uh, in the most intense way, both self and of other people. And we don't know exactly how many portraits he completed, but he completed quite a few, but we don't have access to that many. Uh, and this was sort of uh, in uh, in the house in Antigone that his uh, widow had bought. Uh, this was sort of thrown into a corner and uh, we discovered it with quite a, uh, uh, we were quite shocked. So if you look at the quote and then you look at the way he wrote it, he scratches out an Arcadian dream um, uh, to be shattered at any moment. But that's the key to the entire statement that he makes. It's a key to his life and it's a key to his definition of his life. Uh, which is that at any moment, uh, something could go wrong. My father uh, was, uh, interestingly enough, uh, my father had a way of talking about the, he was a soldier in the army, in the British Army, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But he had a, a way of talking about these events, uh, the Holocaust and so on, and he kept on saying, anti-Semitism hibernates, it never goes away. Well, as uh, many of us have discovered in uh, the recent uh, recent time, I think he was uh, very precise. Hibernation is exactly what was happening. It just exploded far too quickly. So uh, keep, so one thing to keep in mind is that here's a man, of, an artist, who uh, was an absolutely brilliant portrait, portrait painter. Uh, and uh, as you'll see in some of his drawings, an extraordinary capacity to draw uh, the face and to get expression from it and so on. Um, So he, uh, he, he was known as Henry in England, but he was born Heinz. And they, my family arrived in 1938 uh, uh, in, in England. And uh, one of the things that happened to him, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, and keep in mind that what I have are the fragments of, uh, of experiences. I don't have enough detail to fill anything out, but the, it's sort of like I, I deal with it as a kind of poetic expression, pieces here, fragments there, and so on. Uh, in, in a book that I recently completed, uh, which is uh, essentially a kind of novel, although it's also based in, in the real world, I tried to put some sort of synthesis together about the life here and about the life of the arts uh, and, uh, and uh, sort of tell the, the story in a way that actually gave, gave it a sense of continuity. And I'll talk about that in a moment as well. I wanted uh, to show you the first of a trilogy, and I haven't got a great copy of this, uh, a photographic copy of this painting. I'm not entirely sure where this painting is either, but he did a trilogy in the early 50s, and he was only uh, 25 at that point, and which began to define his career. And uh, the, the, this series of paintings, uh, the three of them uh, were vetted and talked about and critiqued and in very, very positive terms. I, I'm gonna explain in greater detail one of the paintings, uh, but I'll leave that up for you for a moment so that you can actually, uh, uh, actually get a sense of it. So it's interesting that as a child, I, I witnessed my parents' and grandparents' trauma throughout their throughout my childhood, their sort of ever-present anxiety, their arguments with each other, uh, and their general uh, discomfort, with, which only got worse with age. And uh, in uh, the, the sort of imaginary memoir that I wrote called The Lost Painter, uh, I tried to bridge some of the gaps. And uh, over the course of uh, a fairly lengthy book, 230 pages, which 
uh, has been translated into Italian and which uh, will be published in Italy in 2025. Um, my effort is, uh, was to explore and distill the lifelong challenges, not only faced by Heinz, but all families affected and afflicted by the traumas of mental and physical injury and geographical displacement. So there's an underlying philosophical framework that I uh, have built into my discussion, which from a, uh, if you're an art critic, you know that that's just one way of approaching uh, the, the quality of what somebody produces, but it's the uh, strategy that I took. And I, I, I'm, I'm very frank about it uh, when I discuss it with uh, friends. I'm just an interpreter of history. Uh, I'm a raconteur, I recount, but I, uh, I wouldn't say that I uh, am the sort of, I have the special magnifying glass that allows me to see all, all the truth that uh, needs to be expressed in it. So one of the most extraordinary things about uh, the post-war period uh, is that there were, uh, and it can, has continued since that time, is that the best way that we have actually had of understanding what happened in the Holocaust has been through testimonials. And those testimonials, which are gathered in libraries in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, London, uh, and elsewhere are, 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 are a, a, a large body of information that has allowed families to talk through the trauma that they've experienced as a consequence of, uh, of the Holocaust. Um, so Heinz died in 1983, and uh, it, we were very close. We spent a lot of time doing things together. Uh, I visited him, he visited me and my family. In fact, he came to visit us, uh, my, my wife and I, with our, our second child, uh, Katie. Uh, he came to visit us and uh, she was uh, all of uh, four or five or six months old and he couldn't get over her head. He kept on stroking her head. It was this beautiful bald bald head with a bit, of, a bit of hair coming out in different parts. He just actually stood with her and just stroked her head, driving her crazy, I think. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, the, con the context of our relationship was one of exploration. We were both interested in so many similar things. And I'll talk about one particular thing we did that may actually give you even more depth of understanding uh, of our relationship. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, continue to approach this through the painting. So let me just go here. Uh, and I'm not going to repeat what's in the slide. You can read it. It's pretty, it's pretty clear. I, I will talk about this, uh, uh, this portrait, which I'm saying circa 1955. I think it could be earlier. I doubt if it's later than that. Um, but this is actually one of his uh, rare, call it non-realistic uh, self-portraits in the sense that he doesn't actually articulate the face fully. But if you explore a little bit of the context in which this was made, it was made during a period of intense uh, uh, struggle that he had with a number of other uh, Jewish painters of the of the time, and which is why I sort of thought this might be early fifties or even late forties. Uh, uh, their 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 struggle with uh, identity and and trying to get recognized and uh, and living in a, in a in a London uh, that, a city that was decimated by the war. So this is an unusual um, uh, self-portrait because he normally actually is very, very important to him was giving the face a real sense of, of presence and meaning. Um, he talked to me one day about uh, this whole period of time when he was a child uh, during the, the depression. And, uh, and he talked a, a great deal about uh, Trieste. So as this uh, slide suggests, Trieste was their destination. Uh, they, they decided to leave in 36 because uh, they, they at that point had hit a wall financially and they basically just had enough money to get on the train and uh, get down to Trieste, which is about three and a half to four hours south uh, east of uh, Vienna. Um, so... <laughs> If you, if you knew Heinz at all, this is the kind of thing that he did. He would suddenly uh, 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 create this be beautiful drawing. Um, and, uh, and then he would say, I used to hide when my parents argued, which was frequently. He, 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 he repeated that phrase, by the way, many, many different times. And this is circa 6970. So it's somewhat later. Uh, we found this in the garbage, uh, by the way. So <laughs> in the, in, in, we had to pull it out and press it to get it back to some sort of form. Um, but he, uh, he, he was so uh, traumatized 
uh, that he, um, you know, kind of, it sort of shows him hiding behind, uh, in the wall almost, uh, as he observes uh, the world around him. But what happened in Trieste was actually rather interesting. Uh, their, their, their lives uh, for a while returned to normal. And uh, they actually started to enjoy their time in Trieste. And uh, the, the brothers spent a great deal of time at Miramar. And um, I, I uh, pulled this picture off the web in the public domain. And this is this beautiful peninsula. Uh, it's a bit more built up now, but in, if, uh, uh, if you look at this particular jetty where I'm putting the, the, the pointer towards here, if you can see it, uh, the jetty just to the right on the far right, they basically read books. They described their, the, with the ocean crashing against the stones. That was the sort of memory both my father and my uncle had. Um, and uh, this particular place in, in Trieste, they, they, they loved. And uh, they started to, uh, and they really spent a lot of time there, but they all, would always talk about it. And when I went back to first visit, it, I was astonished at how beautiful it was and, it, and remains one of the most beautiful places, I, uh, uh, ocean type places. The story of the castle is a completely fascinating one, but uh, it links up to Trotsky, by the way, but I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> okay. Um, here is an again, this is early 49, 50, 51, not sure. Another self portrait, but he's now, uh, you know, provided us with a bit of an outline of his face. At the same time, he's also, you know, his face has disappeared. Uh, he had uh, uh, very conflicted feelings about realism and abstract expressionism. On the one hand, he wanted to paint what he saw. On the other hand, he wanted to paint what he imagined. And you'll see that tension uh, being expressed uh, throughout. Uh, so the, the, again, I'll mention some other painters and uh, who, who also uh, were Jewish and in the 40s in, uh, in, in London and in Great Britain uh, and, and come back to this point. Uh, but if you look at the, the, what's uh, described here in the slide, um, the, uh, they, they got out and they, they tried to persuade members of their family to come, back, come to Trieste with them, and uh, uh, none of them did. And so a large number died uh, and perished. Well, actually, all of them perished in the, in the Holocaust. Um, so how do you deal with a portrait where you evaporate the face? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, a, it's rich in what it suggests uh, about him. And uh, he, he was uh, someone who, who he didn't carry, a, he didn't sort of carry this on his back and sort of moan uh, at all times about it. He just, he just showed himself suffering uh, in every respect. So if we move on here, I'll show you something completely different. Um, here's uh, his mother and here's Heinz when he was uh, in Trieste at the age of, uh, well, he was born in 25, so he's 13 here. Um, and uh, they are uh, very happy. You can see my grandmother smiling, rarely smiled. I never saw her smile actually. <laughs> so this is unusual. Um, and they, what happened was, uh, they were, they were, they found a play, a way of living in Trieste that actually was okay financially. The, the, she, uh, she was a seamstress and my uh, grandfather, uh, worked in the port, uh, and the two boys went to school. Uh, and then, uh, in August of 30, 1938, uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, Rudy was fired from his job. He quickly returned to P Vienna to get passports for the family. Uh, and uh, he described that journey as not only perilous, but very, very perilous. And then he was shocked. He got, got, gets into Vienna and he sees Nazi flags everywhere. And, uh, and yet at the same time, the restaurants were full of people completely oblivious to what was going on. And, he, and I, I put this self-portrait here because uh, I, have, again, have no date for it, uh, but... Um, I wanted to show you how, well, you know how you can tell the date? You can see his hairline receding. So as his hairline recedes, <laughs> he's getting older, obviously, but without, we, we can't be that precise about the time. But I want to show you how he could actually 
portray uh, and some of his paintings uh, where he's actually more of a realist than uh, unimaginably a rich realist, how well he could portray himself. But if you also notice there's a deep tension, anger and, uh, and depression in his face. This is what my uh, grandfather uh, managed to get in the story of his getting the passports was uh, incredible. Uh, so we're talking here uh, late 38. Uh, this is uh, a period of time where the Kristallnacht had not yet happened, but it was close. Uh, you can see the uh, Nazi uh, emblem in the on the bottom uh, left. Um, and uh, we found this, uh, you know, quite accidentally. And I was not, I was thrilled to find it, but also it was very upsetting. Um, and these are the stamps uh, that they got uh, identifying them. There's, uh, it, you may have seen these, ty these types of documents, but they're still upsetting. So they left Trieste um, uh, in uh, 38 uh, and uh, they found it very, very tough. I mean, they were, they described that moment as one of the worst moments in their lives. The train, uh, the Orient Express at that point uh, had a variety of trajectories, but this one went uh, from Trieste uh, to, uh, uh, well, it, it actually shows the connector here, but I, but we're not, we're, we think it's Brieg and Swiss and then they connected upwards, but uh, the, the overall trip was uh, a very, very difficult one. Uh, they were terrified. They bar barely ate anything. They, uh, came to Calais uh, totally dehydrated, uh, and when they got into um, into La into into London after being uh, dealt with at, at one of the ports on the south uh, east uh, coast of uh, England, they were completely psychologically wrecked. Um, hang on. There's an anecdote I wanted to mention to you, by the way, and uh, this may be of interest to you, Monica, which is that uh, in 1958 uh, when uh, uh, I, I remember this as clear as day. I noticed my father, uh, so I was, I was at that point, I was 11. I noticed my father reading a book entitled The Outsider. And he, he actually uh, sort of would walk around with the book. He went to work carrying the book. It was strange. Uh, and in the book was a note from my uncle, which simply said, read this. Well, it was Colin Wilson's book, which, by the way, remains in print. Uh, and it celebrates The Outsider. And I read it after my father finished it. Uh, I didn't understand exactly why they loved it so much, uh, although it was a rather fascinating book. Um, but uh, I never forgot the book and I never forgot the title, which was, uh, uh, in my, to my mind, a very precise way of describing how many Jews felt uh, uh, in, in the environment in England uh, post-war. Um, so this is a really interesting document uh, from the... Um, uh, the Jewish uh, uh, agency with which they worked. And uh, we, we, we managed to read this so that what it says here is the boy now 14 years. So that's uh, just that the, uh, he was uh, born in 25, like I said, so that's 39. Uh, the boy now 14 years has a special talent for drawing. He can be admitted to the junior art school at St. Martin's School of Art, which is pretty amazing. And uh, I, I, we don't know exactly how that particular comment came about, but he uh, had so much talent from the start. Uh, he used to aggravate his father because he would spend most of his time as a child just drawing. Hold on. Now my thing is not going. Why are you not going? Can you... Oh, here we are. Um, so uh, there's another another uh, one that we found uh, where it says, please, please pay two pounds for fees for his son Heinz at the St. Martin School of Art. And that would be in 1940. And uh, here, uh, pay for jackets, uh, trousers, shoes, and so on. So they, they, were, they were penniless. And um, uh, it was a very, very tough time for the family, uh, the entire period uh, of the war. Uh, was very, very, very in, uh, intense. Let me jump to uh, uh, another experience. Heinz and I went in the early uh, 1960s 
uh, he, he was given a Harkins scholarship, which is one of the top scholarships that you can get to go to New York, that you could get at that time to go to New York. And uh, he was uh, basically in New York for a couple of years, uh, became very well known. And we drove down together from Montreal. He came to get me. And he said, I'm going to take you on a, a tour of uh, studios and so on. Well, the stories are very funny here. You know, it takes me to Mark Rothko's studio. Uh, they'd become friends. And he says, uh, what do you think of the paintings? And I'm, I'm looking at these quite beautiful paintings, but, you know, I had no understanding of them. And he, and he said, uh, and then I heard him say, and I memorized it because I found it so interesting, even though I was only a, a youngster. He said, I've never seen work that is so empty and so full at the same time. And uh, this uh, stayed with me uh, throughout my adulthood as, as one of the really interesting perceptions of Rothko's work. But he took me to, you know, the, the, the opening of Andy Warhol's film that lasts for 24 hours on New York. And we, we basically sat there for about 20 hours. I didn't understand a thing. He, he, I, I, we went from studio to studio and I met some of the greatest artists of the period, I might add. And I have very vague <laughs> memories of that entire experience. But the reason I bring it up is because he had actually become very well known in New York. He had six exhibitions in a, in a period of about 10 years. Uh, there are many uh, uh, museums in the United States, in, including Yale, which uh, own his paintings. And I should say that uh, about 100 of his paintings are in museums, the best museums and galleries around the world, including in Canada, by the way, in the Beaver Brook in New Brunswick, which is was a shock when we discovered that. He once said to me uh, that his work uh, is, uh, well, I'll quote him, harmony mixed with chaos. Uh, and uh, I think that actually uh, is an interesting way of thinking about uh, what he did and how he handled himself in, in, in a very, very, very difficult time. I'm having some trouble with this. It's weird. Okay. So uh, just to get back to the story uh, of getting into in England, um, they uh, Walter actually joined the army, my, my uh, father. Uh, he And this is the story of how I, people always say to me, well, why is your name Burnett? Well, when he joined the army, he uh, was uh, immediately, it was suggested to him that he joined the commandos. He was a tall man, six foot three, uh, very strong. Uh, and uh, they said, however, if you join the commandos, you have to change your name because uh, the Nazis, if they find out that you're a Jew, an inlander would give them the signal, uh, will just simply kill you and, and, and that's the end of it. Uh, so he changed his name. He was uh, reading a book by W.R. Burnett, uh, so his name Walter, and so he said, well, I'll have, I'll take the name Burnett, and then after the war, he refused to return to Inland, and he said, uh, you know, because he, he was so scared uh, of, uh, of the impact of being recognized as Jewish. Um, th this painting is a really interesting example of uh, actually the conflicts that I've been discussing and psychologically and so on. Here's a, here's a, uh, uh, a painting where he actually has a quote attached to it, which is darkness hangs over every sunrise. Uh, and uh, this is a beautiful abstract painting, which many people are unaware of the fact that he did, he did actually show abstract uh, work. I'm going to speed up a bit because I'm, uh, this is my fa father, his commando corps. I just threw this in because I, I, I think it's just an extraordinary photo. And then, um, I've mentioned, I want to mention Eric Deutsch and Hans Eisenmeier. I don't know if uh, uh, Katie Deutsch is on the, on this call, uh, but we know uh, Eric Deutsch, a very well-known and wonderful artist. We know his, uh, his daughter uh, very well. And uh, we also, uh, my wife and I met at one point Hans, Hans Eisenmeier, who is, who is a very uh, close friend of Heinz's as well. And they, they all got together in this uh, organization called the Young Austria Movement, uh, which uh, allowed them to sort of talk and get to know each other better and, and understand what they were doing with their work. But I wanted to mention, aside from uh, many of you uh, from Canada will not know Victor Passmore and William Coldstream, but suffice it to say, two of the most important uh, artists uh, working uh, in England at that time. And Coldstream eventually in the late 60s wrote a report 
on the arts in Great Britain, which became uh, a guide and an important uh, explanation of the impact and power of the arts uh, in Britain. But I want to mention that John Berger became a very close friend of Heinz's, and um, uh, he, uh, he 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 and uh, Heinz learned a great deal. Uh, John Berger is the author of that famous book, Ways of Seeing, which came out in the early 70s and which was used in probably every educational institution that I can ever imagine. Uh, so uh, Berger became very famous um, and uh, he and I became friends over time. Uh, we published a journal called Cinetracks, which was a journal of uh, film and communications uh, and art. And uh, John actually contributed to the first issue uh, the script of a film made by a, Swede, uh, a Swiss filmmaker, Alain Tenner. Uh, so uh, as a consequence of his relationship with Heinz, we became, he and I became close friends. Um, this is the second of the trilogy that I mentioned earlier. So if you look at this painting, I mean, this is a really beautiful painting. Um, uh, I, if, this one has been slightly restored. If you if you look carefully in the background, you'll see an archangel walking away from what looks like Adam and Eve. Um, and so this was his uh, <laughs> his way of uh, uh, explaining or looking at or trying to understand in a symbolic sense uh, the the whole story of uh, of the Bible and all. And here's uh, an exhibition, the uh, first one man, one man exhibition of paintings in 1956 at the Leicester, which was the, the top gallery of the time in London. Uh, and uh, this was a major exhibition and received extraordinarily positive critiques. His career was uh, very much enhanced by this. And just to take the thematic a bit further, this is a painting that actually has a title written on the back. He doesn't sign many of his paintings. He doesn't actually write their titles. Uh, so, you know, we're working with very little there. Uh, but this is uh, The Burning Bush. And uh, so again, he begins to try and figure out ways in which he can symbolize this uh, interrelationship between religion and artistic creativity. And this is a, a further example in 51, owned by uh, UCL, because Heinz, uh, uh, after he finished uh, the work with um, St. Martin's, he went to a school called Camberwell, and then he went to so the Slade, which was the top school of the time. And UCL has some extraordinary paintings of Heinz's that, that have been kept in such good shape. When you see the colors, you freak out, because compared to the, all most of his paintings that I have, uh, are in need of either restoration or cleaning. So the, the issue about this uh, drawing is uh, that he um, he's, he's there sitting in the, I don't know if you noticed, but he's sitting in the, right, right here in a second. We assume this is his father uh, because of the way he, the, the, close, the proximity between the two of them. And, but this is not his mother, we don't think. Um, but it's a very, you know, the question is, is this a synagogue? Is this a, a train station? Uh, is this Holocaust related? It, uh, we had a long discussion with the uh, archivists at UCL uh, a couple of, uh, some years ago in London, and uh, we concluded probably that it was actually a synagogue, um, but it, we're, we're not sure. So Heinz was also a whimsical person. Uh, he, he loved to play with words and he loved to talk about all sorts of different things. He show, show, showed uh, this drawing in one of his exhibitions and people loved it. I had no idea. I think we own it, but I, we have so much stuff we don't know what we own anymore. So we, we have to do a catalog at a certain point of what we have. Um, but again, it, this is actually taking portraiture to another level. He's playing with uh, truth and lying and, port and, and, and anonymity and presence and uh, and again, this is uh, this whole notion of anonymity is one that he explores uh, in great depth throughout his career. And don't ask me how he explores anonymity, but he does. <laughs> um, so I want to. This is the third painting in the trilogy, and th if you look here, you, this is in very bad shape. So uh, you know, we try. We're trying very hard to figure out how to get this one. We have had it reframed uh, to preserve it, but it's just been scratched and torn and and so on. But they're carrying beds here. And this is his, this is the one that won in the Prix de Rome uh, and uh, got him back to Italy, which he, he really wanted. 
Uh, and uh, when he did talk about this, he did talk about the Holocaust and um, the, 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 the general problem that he had in trying to picture uh, or paint uh, the, the experience that she said was unpaintable. I, I put this in because uh, this is a rare photo, actually the only photo of him at work, uh, which is quite lovely. So the pre de Rome, there's a, 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 an individual a man by the name of James McLaughlin. And uh, if anyone is interested, I can actually send this quote to you directly so you don't have to worry about reading it. Um, but here we're, we're, we boosted the colors a bit and tried to sit, sort of see more about what was happening. And clearly, this is clearly a bed or a bench, something. Uh, and then in this area, the pit here, there are other elements that you can't see because the boosting eliminates them. Um, but the Prix de Rome, on. Uh, the Prix de Rome was amazing because it took him to the uh, Borghese Gardens and to the British School. Any of you that ever visit Rome again should go to the Borghese Gardens and then actually walk over to the British School. It's one of the great buildings uh, in Rome. And uh, he, he was a, a significant figure in the British School. Uh, in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. And at a certain point, he actually was in charge of doing a lot of uh, the, the teaching and so on. But the point about this one uh, is that he met Peter Lanyon. For those of you who don't know who Peter Lanyon is, he was at the, the time in the uh, early 50s, uh, one of the most famous British painters. And he still is uh, revered his work is extraordinary. And uh, my my wife and I know his son, Martin Lanyon, and have actually visited them in uh, Cornwall where they live, which is where Peter Lanyon is from. The, the point about this is, and this is where Antiquity Corrado comes in, about 60 kilometers to the east of Rome, uh, in the Lazio, in the mountains, uh, there is this village, Antiquity Corrado. And uh, Lanyon and Heinz were just on a scooter and they just kind of decided to go to, to the to, work, to the village. And as, as they approached it, and it's still the, the same road to approaching it is still there. They turned to each other and they said, Shangri-La, because it's a, it's, a, it's a village literally in the sky when you first see it. And if there's clouds around, it's extraordinary. Um, I just want to mention this because Heinz actually became a very significant at the British School. And uh, he's well remembered there. We got hundreds of uh, documents from the school that we scanned that we have. Uh, they were very helpful to us, but he, everyone knew about him. And um, he became really good friends with Derek Hill. And if you know British painting, Derek Hill was a very important person in, in British painting. Uh, but he also became friends uh, with, uh, and you see these names here. Uh, where, where is he now? He became very good friends with Vespignani, who uh, was a very important painter in that period, and uh, Mario Ma Maffei. Uh, and so they actually put an exhibition together of 22 of his works, and uh, the, the press was delighted with, uh, with that. And then I discovered a painting of Heinz's. This is Heinz on the right and Vespignani on the left, and you begin to see the relationship between the two went further than simply kind of intellectual discussion. This is an exceedingly beautiful painting. Um, and I won't sort of amplify what has been said. I'll let you uh, read it. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm getting to the end of my time here, so I'm going to try to be very careful. Um, I want, I wanted to mention to you, uh, in terms of actually the experience of, uh, of relating to Heinz and, and trying to understand, and by the way, Sheila Fell, who uh, is listed here is one of the most extraordinary British painters of the time, not well known, uh, in Canada or, or elsewhere, but an extraordinary painter. But I want to mention to you how, uh, drunk with art Heinz was in the fall of 1968, he and I went to the Hayward gallery and those of you who are British will, will, will know this. It was the most, it was the first and the largest comprehensive exhibition of Van Gogh paintings and drawings um, mounted in Britain uh, post-war. Uh, and the Hay Hayward at that point was a very important gallery uh, in, in uh, London. 
Uh, the experience of going to Heinz with that exhibition was extraordinary. It's kind of funny that today there's an, uh, there's another big exhibition happening in London of Van Gogh's work. So I, I think that's an interesting timing thing. Uh, Heinz actually just literally, there were, I, we're talking a packed, packed gallery spaces. And he moved from painting to painting as if he'd uh, rediscovered Van Gogh. And uh, the, the experience we had together there was hours in the making. Uh, we didn't leave, notwithstanding the fact that there were so many people there. And then he finally, at some point, and I don't remember the actual painting, he sat down uh, on a bench and he looked at this painting from a distance and uh, he, he he didn't cry, but he started, there were tears in his eyes. Uh, something had, had triggered, uh, where, and that, this is the whole point about trauma. Something uh, can trigger you suddenly, uh, out of nowhere, and uh, suddenly you remember something or it links to something else or another kind of narrative appears. And, uh, and and the pain returns in a way that's very difficult to manage. This is Antigone, just so you can see it. Uh, and uh, there, it's a, like I said, a small village. Uh, I mentioned to Monica that its fame actually began uh, with a um, quite extraordinary uh, reputation. Uh, its women were assumed to be the, the most beautiful in Europe. And as a consequence of that, uh, painters came in great numbers. Now, we're talking about uh, the great painters of many generations. Uh, if you go to visit people in Antiquity, you see in their houses, that you see you see paintings by very famous painters. I mean, Picasso, I'm talking about the, the top of the top. Marcel Duchamp visited uh, as well. And was uh, there was an anecdot anecdotal story about him sitting in the piazza, the main piazza, just smoking a cigarette and driving people crazy. Um, but it, it went beyond, uh, this village went beyond just simply artists. Uh, there were poets as well. Uh, basically the most, the most famous Spanish poet of the 20th century, Rafael Alberti, uh, lived for a while in the village. Uh, and uh, Rafael became very good friends with uh, Heinz and uh, with, with me. And uh, uh, you know, we have uh, from Heinz and from his wife, uh, uh, his wife Antonia, we have multiple uh, drawings and books and so forth that Raphael uh, gave them. When he died in 1999, a million people came out in the streets of Madrid, I mean, for his uh, funeral. Uh, there are not many places in the world where a poet has that kind of presence and power. I'm going to speed up here. Um, wanted to mention in the John Berger, uh, we have this uh, extraordinary book, uh, by the way, published in New York. Uh, with, I mean, it has uh, people like Henry Moore, uh, name a famous artist of the time. And the cover drawing, you may not know Derek Rees, but he was a very famous British, uh, British artist. And uh, uh, I think it's the next slide where, no, uh, this is a, a, a statement uh, by um, uh, Berger on uh, on drawing, uh, and uh, it's again too long to read. I, I, I'll leave it up for a second here. Uh, <clears throat> just get a drink. Okay, so um, I'm going to speed ahead here a bit. Um, this uh, particular self-portrait in 1954, uh, again, if you notice, uh, I mean, he, it's not only that he doesn't actually ha smile, he always tries to project this image of deep uh, sort of lack. Um, and uh, he once said to me about this one, because I asked him, I, I, I love this uh, painting. And I, uh, and by the way, in the background is a, some sort of representation of that Pre to Rome, which I'm not sure exactly how that, it's very hard to tell, but it's, uh, it's one of his paintings. Um, uh, yeah, I, and I would I say to him, you, you, it's hard to tell if you're depressed, happy, or if you're just angry. And he said, all three. So that was the answer that, <laughs> that I got on that one. Uh, and this is just to show you the level of uh, critiques and uh, analyses when he went, won the, uh, the, uh, the Peter Rome, it was a, the, this is from the Times. 
and uh, and and this here, I don't know the uh, origin. Of, no, this is not from the Times. This is from another paper. I don't know the origin of this, but James Burr was a critic uh, at the at, uh, of some importance. And uh, again, here you see this. There are many drawings like this where you see, and he actually signs these, which is really strange. Uh, many drawings where he's actually just working with his face, uh, trying to understand, I think, what's happening to him. I mentioned Derek Hill. Uh, this is uh, Heinz's portrait of Derek Hill, which uh, is, uh, was bought by the National Trust uh, and hangs in Hampshire. Uh, this is the, uh, he uh, describes this painting, uh, the, yeah, it actually has a title on the back, The Tempest. Uh, it was restored by the Aberdeen Art Gallery in uh, 2019. They sent us uh, this image and said uh, they were overwhelmed by the colors that came back uh, with the restoration. Uh, this is a truly extraordinary uh, painting. This is not too far away from his death. Uh, uh, very sad. The eye slowly disappears. There's uh, something very difficult about this painting. I have a hard time actually looking at it. Um, and yet, at the same time, he could be quite uh, funny. Uh, so uh, he 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 always had a a, a black a black dog, either a, a vagrant as he described them, or uh, or he'd get a puppy, or uh, he there. But he always had a black dog. But a lot of paintings, and he said, you know, I'm the black dog. And here's a black dog sniffing the nude woman on the beach. Uh, so it's Heinz sniffing the woman on the beach. Um, uh, no idea where this, uh, I think we have this painting, but not entirely sure. Um, and this is from this gallery in New York, Roland Browse and Del Banco, which had a, an a, a exhibit. Or maybe somebody will correct me on that. That might actually be a British gallery, but anyway. Um, and, but this painting here uh, sold, uh, and he 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 loved this. Uh, he sent me a picture of it, saying, "One of my better my better works." And I wanted to mention that he um, he 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 loved animals. We have a wonderful uh, painting of a frog diving into water, which is very simple but very very beautiful. And this is like his. We have uh, hundreds of his uh, little books where he drew. And this is the kind of animal that he drew. So he 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 was uh, just constantly working. Um, here's actually a quote from him. Uh, so he he paints this, and then he uh, in the quote uh, he talks about uh, landscape as a pretext for the idea of an ideal world disrupted by visual elements, and Vietnam and Biafra. Uh, I want it to be peaceful yet arcadian, disrupted, fated. Um, so this is a very, very interesting, uh, rare kind of explanation uh, of what he actually did. And this is one of his last self-portraits done, we think, in 1981. Um, and uh, it's uh, uh, 74 inches by 60 inches. It's massive. Uh, and it, it's extremely powerful, um, and one one of the one of those paintings that uh, truly indicate his mastery of uh, of of the art. And just to finish here, uh, this is uh, the book that's coming out in Italy. Uh, hopefully, uh, in the fall of twenty twenty five, we want the book to come out in conjunction with his the centenary of his birth. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, the book will will have some impact in bringing back his story. Final kind of thing here, John Berger in the, the Royal Academy Summer Show of 1957 was asked, is there anything good in the Academy? And, and he, he, he mentioned this landscape by Henry and uh, or Heinz, and uh, uh, I can I, I don't remember exactly. It was sort of a, a story that came afterwards, but I know that this particular moment for him was his moment in the sun. Thank you. This is one of his great paintings, by the way, which we think is called the Winged Angel, but we're not sure. So Hi. I. I think I did it right. A good time here. What do you think? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely fine. Thank you so much. Um, how about stopping the screen share so we can uh, yeah. initiate a conversation? 
Lovely. I haven't. I normally ask people to type any comments they might have into the chat, but since we're a fairly small number, I thought, and many of you I think already know Ron, I thought it might be nice to keep things fairly, um, actually, hold on, there's somebody wanting to come in, uh, fairly informal and, and sort of impromptu. Um, so I have certainly things I might like to ask about or comment, but would anybody else like to set the ball rolling? If you'd like to unmute yourself, put your hand up, put a sort of virtual hand up, or you simply just put, put your hand up and uh, <laughs> you can then unmute yourselves. Ron, just one very quick and simple and obvious question for starters. You say, and I'm delighted to hear it, there's a book coming out in Italian yeah. next year. An English translation? Has that been investigated? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm, my, my, I'm doing things in a way that is kind of a little bit, may strike people as backwards, but actually... I would like the uh, the book to come out in Italian and at that point uh, connect with some of the publishers that I had been talking to in England. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that I was a very, uh, uh, you know, the initial phase, I did try and contact some Canadian publishers, but the Canadian publishers were so negative about the idea of this strange, uh, this strange um, British painter and Italy's connection to it and so on that I actually turned off very quickly in trying to deal with them. Um, and so I, uh, I, I'm very interested in seeing how the book does in Italy uh, 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 as best as I can. I've looked at the translation and uh, the, the people working on it have been absolutely wonderful. And uh, I think that there's something quite special to it. And I think that will allow me to loop back to some of the British publishers that I've had some conversations with. Interesting you say that they're sort of slightly wary, the British or Canadian publisher slightly wary because it doesn't quite fit. And this, I think, actually corroborates what you've been saying and what my whole project is about, that somebody who doesn't fit neatly into a pigeonhole, into a category, it's a problem, isn't it? I mean, it really, you know, it makes them wonderfully interesting as individuals, but in terms of getting the work out there, being seen, being acknowledged, the inability of the outside world to classify is 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 problematic, isn't it? Or an obstacle perhaps to recognition. It, it shouldn't be like that, but it often it often is. Yes, so, well, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think that's a good point. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, and uh, I think the the issue the issue is it's not only the pigeonholing, it's the idea that a particular kind of narrative structure has to be applied to the a type of a story that you want to tell. Uh, and uh, the implications of that, uh, in my mind, are quite serious because it means that there's a sort of uh, flattening of the, the differences that might be generated uh, by different kinds of approaches to narrative. Uh, and this approach that I've chosen is uh, quite self-conscious. Uh, uh, it plays with uh, the artifice of storytelling as much as it tells the story itself. So, you know, uh, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't write it as a traditional autobiography, biography, or uh, as a memoir. And it's filled with all sorts of uh, elisions and uh, ideas moving through it. So it's uh, it's a different kind of book. I don't want to hog the conversations, as they put it. So would anybody else like to ask or comment at all? Um, I don't know, uh, Ron, whether you can see the chat. We've got a message here from... Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I think it's open to everybody. Thanks so much, Ron. We recall much of the history from our trip to Antiquoli with you and Martha. But the explanation of Heinz's art really brings out the beauty and his skill. Absolutely. Um, while that, people are sort of gathering their thoughts and uh, pondering what they might say, um, let me ask you a few more things, if I may. I was intrigued. I mean, this trilogy about the Holocaust, as you put it, from the early 50s, what mm -hmm. did you give it a title? What evidence do we have that that was paramount in his, his mind as he was producing the work? There are a variety of titles. Mm -hmm. um, in, in one case, uh, for one of the paintings, the second one, I think, he actually says uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, for, the th for the third one, uh, th there's some vague scribbles, uh, which are very hard to read, but uh, I believe that uh, he was uh, look. He, I think he was trying to uh, work with destruction and landscape, construction and destruction, but I, but there's the, it, it, it's very hard to tell. Unfortunately, uh, you know, and I mean, I mean, there is a tradition where painters actually don't sign their paintings until they sell them, <laughs> which I think in his case, he overdid. Uh, and uh, he, he, um, he, he resisted the, the as much, he was a wonderful teacher. He taught at the Camerill 
uh, School of Art and uh, and later on uh, Camerell uh, College uh, of, of Art. He taught there for many years. He was the head of painting for many years. Uh, and uh, but he resisted uh, interpretive strategies. Uh, he 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 was sort of like it was a the best way to describe it was that he wanted to bear his emotions, but he didn't want to talk about what he'd actually shown, which I see as part of that sort of traumatic space that he was negotiating. I saw it in my father who uh, uh, chose uh, silence as a strategy of navigating his own emotions and his own personal history. Uh, so, um, it, I, yeah, I don't, ha I don't have enough on the, that trilogy to be able to be as precise as I would like to be. No, that's what I expected you to answer, I guess, because it seemed to me quite unusual. And yes, it was still very early on in his career. You know, the war experience was very raw, but to actually do anything as explicit as that, yeah. because his work in subsequent years clearly avoids that explicitness, doesn't it? And that's part of its enigmatic yeah, that's, a, rich, yeah, that's you know, a really good no, that's a really, yeah no it's a really good point although i'd have to say uh and i haven't shown the slides of that but i'd have to say there's some paintings from the 70s that begin to explore from a different perspective and are more uh, a combination of surreal and real than the other paintings mm -hmm. uh he eventually became uh Sus he he began to be, began to worry about doing too much landscape, and he started to uh, work with. Uh, there's paintings where he's starting to work with figures, uh, in, uh, people in, in working on uh, on field in fields, and he was fascinated by uh, as he, uh, he was uh, as he described it. Uh, you know, the working class give, gives us all the food we need to eat, and uh, we give them back the trash. Uh, and uh, he, that's a that's a quote from him. <laughs> and but he but he was also I have to say he 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 knew a lot of people. So I'll give you a good example. Suddenly he uh, sends me a letter. Remember, there's no internet at that point. And he says, uh, "When will you be in Calgary?" And I said I wrote him back. So this this is over a number of weeks. I wrote him back and I said, "Well, I'll never be in Calgary. That's a dump. I don't want to go to Calgary. That's in Alberta." So I want to stay away from Calgary. <laughs> so uh, he, subsequently, I discovered that he'd uh, gotten to know the Cayuca family. Anyone that uh, lives in Western Canada knows that uh, Roy Cayuca, for example, uh, was one of the most famous poets uh, in Canadian history. I lived on the West Coast. His poetry is extraordinary. Uh, and his brother uh, lived in Calgary and was a teacher at uh, the uh, University of Calgary in the art department. Well, lo and behold, uh, here's Heinz and his uh, wife, Antonia, in the late 60s, uh, uh, arriving in Montreal. They go and buy a, a car, a uh, dump of a car, and they drive to Calgary, which I thought, oh, my God. And they stayed in Calgary for seven months. Uh, he was teaching. And um, I still today get letters from his students uh, who uh, experienced his teaching in Calgary. And there's one of them who uh, is obsessive, uh, has an obsessive relationship with the memories of his experience uh, with Heinz. But, uh, it, and then uh, one day I was sitting with Roy Kuk, I've forgotten the first name of his brother. Uh, we were, uh, we were uh, when I was president of the car, Roy, uh, Roy Kuk came to visit. I was in awe of him. He's a wonderful poet. And Roy said to me, he said, well, you know, the, the work that you, your uncle did in Calgary changed the art scene in Calgary. And I subsequently have come to agree with that because he, uh, he is, is in six or seven months, he became famous in the city. And, and then he, he drove this crazy car that was falling apart uh, back to Montreal and said, I'm never coming back to Canada. <laughs> so yeah. it had another effect as well. Interesting, this uh, issue of being, you know, such an effective and, and inspirational teacher, because I think certainly one of the ways in which, more generally speaking, the emigres really did leave their mark on younger artists was precisely through their teaching activities. And I'm intrigued. Um, I think I'm right in saying that one of the other important emigre painters at Camberwell for many a long year was Martin Bloch, who actually came from yes. Berlin originally. Is that yes. a name that you're familiar with and that he had contact yes, with? Yes, yes, absolutely. But I'll tell you another story, which uh, some people on this call will know, uh, which is very, very interesting, which is that um, uh, Heinz was so 
uh, uh, he, he was up and down. He was sometimes very depressed, sometimes not depressed. Um, but he, uh, he, he discovered in Antiquity that uh, uh, he, he, it's hard to describe exactly what this is, but he discovered a, a capacity for human relations that made him a beloved part of the village, which is not what happened to him in London, where he, mm -hmm. he was somewhat inconsistent, even though the, the students loved him, and, but he had a lot of conflicts. But in the village, he was beloved, uh, and he would do crazy things. Like um, there, he and Peter Lanyon, for example, there's a, 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 a sort of very dark, uh, hard, a sort of grotto kind of area in the village. And he and Peter Lanyon painted this extraordinary uh, vision of the Madonna uh, and uh, put candles in it. And here's a Jew and a, a non-Jew painting the Madonna in a, in a grotto in a small village in Italy. It's completely absurd. Uh, but uh, that thing is being is has been preserved now for fifty or sixty sixty years. And you when you go when you go to the village, you look at the in the grotto, and you see the candles are still lit uh, uh, for the this sort of depiction of the Madonna. So he was uh, he he was the type of person that could implicate himself into an environment and be loved for his work. Uh, but he was also the kind of person that would turn you know, on a dime and uh, become just very silent and very, very mm -hmm. strange. Uh, mm -hmm. Another another interesting story is uh, my wife and I went to see uh, uh, Sir Alan Bonus, mm -hmm. uh, very famous, again, for the Canadians on this call, uh, one of the founders of the Tate in the 1980s uh, and uh, a significant figure in the world of art. And uh, I had written him a letter saying, you know, I, I noticed that you had written a fair bit about, about Heinz. I'd, I'd love to meet you. He was in his early nineties and um, an extraordinary person. And uh, so we bang, banged on his door. Uh, he was in uh, South London and uh, he opened the door and he, he looked at me and said, uh, hmm, you look a bit like your uncle. Actually, you look a lot like your uncle, which unnerves me totally. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not my uncle. Uh, anyway, we went and had this quite wonderful discussion about how careers develop in and continue in the same way, uh, develop and how they're, some careers are crushed, some critics crush careers and so on. But he, 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 he made one comment that uh, stayed with me, which was that uh, if Heinz had stayed with it in the, uh, uh, in the mid 50s, he, uh, everyone felt that Heinz was one of the next great painters of that mm -hmm. time. Uh, and so I, uh, the reason I, I talk about trauma is that I think that Heinz could not see that possibility with the clarity that he needed. And so he, he, he drifted. And uh, psychologically, he was just unable to take the potential pressure that would come from recognition, even though that's the thing he wanted most in the world. So that tug of war between the desire to be someone and be recognized and the desire to be someone who's not recognized just in a corner doing his own thing was never resolved and i think actually uh, i uh, i think the metaphor here would be that tore his heart apart and he died of a heart attack mm. Now's the moment if anybody would like to say anything. I can see a lot of people nodding sort of in sympathy as as ron has been talking um i assume that quite a few of uh, yes, Maya. Is it Maya? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, I don't want to take us too far back in the early slides that you showed, but um, the, when you showed the slide where they're asking for the the I think it was two pounds um for the fees to pay for for Heinz to go to um the St Martin's and then also for the the jacket, trousers, shoes for a boy who was so so crazy to see that um and that that came from the world jewish relief i'm wondering um if you want to describe a little bit more you know the, the challenges of even just getting that at that point in time um as you may have heard through heinz or through walter or that sort of thing well it's an interesting story uh, uh martha and i my wife, my wife martha and i went uh to london uh, a number of years ago and uh, we had made an appointment to meet with the world jewish relief because we'd seen this sort of really uh, interesting, I'd seen this interesting article in the uh, Times of uh, London um, where uh, they were talking about the records that had been kept by the by that organization 
which was a, a relief organization, but nonetheless uh, very, very important to the survival. I mean, many, many thousands of people survived uh, the war because of them. Um, and uh, so we made an appointment to go and see them, and we met this extraordinary woman uh, uh, in, in this uh, quite, quite beautiful place, uh, this sort of house that had been converted into a series of offices. And um, she said, well, you know, uh, it's really hard to find this stuff. They don't have that much, actually, but uh, somehow and somewhere I remember this name. Uh, the name Inland is somehow registered and stayed, had stayed with her. Uh, and so we talked in general about Heinz and about the the conditions he worked under and about the uh, contradictions of his uh, of his uh, life and work. And she became quite obsessed with finding <laughs> finding more information. And then uh, she did. Uh, and we had actually prepared this visit uh, in, in, through a, a series of letters. Uh, and so she did find, and she found uh, about the equivalent of about 75 pages of, uh, or 60, 65 pages of notes of the kind that I showed on the slide. And it, they're all very similar, you know, money for food, money for this. So there is one rather interesting uh, one about uh, a quarrel that Heinz had with his sister. Uh, Heinz, uh, sorry, not Heinz, uh, uh, Rudy, his father, had with his sisters. Um, uh, his father, Rudy, was a, 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 a very hard to describe, a pianist, a performer, crazy musician, uh, who, uh, to survive, uh, became an accountant and who lost everything in the 1929 crash and saw his life disappear basically from that point on, which he never got over it, by the way. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the, the conjuncture of detail that we had provided, um, and, uh, and, and this particular event, which I'll describe, made this woman very interested in, the, in getting the material out for us. Uh, so when they were uh, dealing with this agency and he, his sister came at one point and they started a quarrel. And there's actually a, a, a note that said, brother and sister quarreling. You can imagine how, how, how much of a quarrel that must have been for them to write a note about it. And in the note, it says they better get it together in different language. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, Heinz was faced with a father who uh, wanted to be an artist. And they're, you know, yeah. Uh, Many years ago, when my wife and I were in London, he took us into his flat. His his my grandmother had already died, and he started to play the piano for us. And he was very very talented. I mean, it was an incredible talent, but he never realized it. I think there's lots of stories about people like that uh, who came over to uh, as refugees and didn't find the path that would allow them to realize their ambitions. Um, so those uh, uh, the people at uh, World Jewish Relief were amazing. And I would have to add that the people at the um, uh, at uh, the uh, British School in Rome were extraordinary as well. And in fact, uh, there we got hundreds of pages copied, uh, which we filed away, which provide very interesting details about the background of British art in that period, about what people were thinking about, what they were actually aiming for, and Heinz's role in that. And Heinz is actually, there's a, a book by Lord Snowden, uh, a big format book, and Heinz is uh, in Lord Snowden's book. Uh, I we can't afford to actually pay for the rights to sh to show the picture on my website where I have some articles about Heinz. But um, uh, he, he the, he's there with some of the most important people of the period, uh, working on the future of art. So it's not as if he didn't implicate himself more directly in the actual life. That he wanted to lead but he always came like a diver comes to the diving board and he never fully dove in he kind of flew halfway and then scrambled back that's my metaphor mm -hmm. so that, that, uh, the photograph that uh, you're referring to taken by lord snowden is is in this book this compilation but it's also held technically by the national portrait gallery right in london so it's, it's considered it's shown, it's shown an, an important right. photograph, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Nani, is it? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a question because I. this is all learning for me, but I just want to say how remarkable this whole project is for somebody who's just listening to the whole 
way you've put it together. It's just incredible. Not only the, you know, the micro about his life, the macro about the Holocaust and about trauma, but I guess what's really struck me is just how much love you've put into this whole project. And I, I'm just so moved by what, what you've done. Well, thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And if I can just sort of interject there that actually I've organized quite a lot of talks precisely by family members and it, that personal intimate relationship lends a very special quality, doesn't it, to the presentations. But as you say, Ron also has that much wider cultural and, you know, sort of psych psychological perspective that, that enriches the, the, the talk. Um, yes, in, indeed. And looking at the time, it's probably certainly in the UK, supper time, but uh, if anybody would like to take the opportunity to say or ask one last thing. Martha, did you have... No, no, no. Just a point of fact, by the way, Ron, just, just so you know, uh, uh, Roland Browse and Del Banco is indeed very much a London gallery with an interesting history, Cork Street, you know, the centre of West End sort of art world. And indeed, Roland and Del Banco were both Jewish, Jewish, emperors, yeah, Jewish yeah. refugees. So there are all yeah. these kind of interesting connections. And you mentioned Eisenmeier and Eric Deutsch. And I can't resist saying that actually when I was a young teenager, I had my portrait painted by Eric Deutsch without knowing anything about his wow. background or <laughs> connections. That's entirely, by the way. And John Berger is an interesting one. Edmund Cap he exhibited with. There was Yvonne Cap, who I sus mm -hmm. suspect, I don't know, was probably his wife or his sister who actually yeah. was active Quite in probably. helping refugees from Czechoslovakia. So I'm just sort of thinking there's probably more to be found out in terms of the networks, the kind of relationships that enabled him in certain ways. Yeah, there's, uh, uh, Martha, what's the name of Bruno's, what's Bruno's last name? Oh, she hasn't turned on her sound. So uh, Bruno Schrecker, oh, Bruno who Schrecker. is alive, uh, an acclaimed world famous cellist, mm. who was one of the founders of the Allegri Quartet, mm -hmm. Uh, we discovered is a whole um, other circle of people that Heinz was very much involved with, uh, also from Vienna originally, and uh, so on. So there were lots of intersecting worlds, I think, as well. Think um, and we turn turns out in a in a file folder, um, we discovered Heinz and his wife Antonia's marriage license, and Bruno Schrecker was a witness. Mm -hmm. at the um, registry office where they got married. And we hadn't known that. We tracked Bruno down and saw him a number of years ago. He's still very much with us. He lives in Bath mm -hmm. and he still plays cello. And um, I think was giving master classes as, as of a few short years ago. Lovely. Um, no, I, I was pricking up my ears with the mention of music because you also mentioned, I think it was actually your father and and. Heinz, who were interned on the Isle of Man, or actually, yes. no, no, hold no, on. My it grandfather. My grandfather, your grandfather, wasn't it? Because that's yeah. a whole other ball game, as they say. I mean, very fascinating. Yeah. There are quite a lot yeah. of internment yeah. related um, recordings on, on the Inside is Outsiders YouTube channel, if you're interested in pursuing it. But the creative life of those interned, the so-called enemy aliens, you know, in 1940, mostly on the Isle of Man. Very interesting indeed. And, you know, as some of you may already know, for example, the Amadeus Quartet, three of the four actually met first as internees on the Isle of Man. So again, I'm wondering about that network, you know. And also I noticed in one of the press cuttings, he lived in Greencroft Gardens, which again yes. made me prick up my ears because that was an area just um, on the less sort of uh, wealthy side of, of Finchley Road, sort of in northwest London, sort of West Hampstead rather than Hampstead proper, uh, where a huge number of the refugees congregated, you know, so I, you know, there is more perhaps I, uh, to find I, out. Uh, yeah, I have, uh, I, I, uh, I can actually draw for you the flat on 30, it's 33 Greencroft Gardens yeah. if you walk by it. <laughs> and uh, it's an extraordinary flat and I, uh, I remember it in great, uh, great detail. And uh, I remember Finchley Road and uh, all, uh, I actually even remember after my parents got married, uh, the one room flat that uh, was on 49 Belsize Avenue. Um, and I, the, that, uh, that part of my life, uh, I remember with, uh, with photographic clarity, I can, I can actually draw the rooms, the spaces. I can actually tell you about fights and conversations. I can tell you the content mm -hmm. of what I heard and I have no idea how in the world I've actually been able to remember those things. <laughs> Weird. Interesting. 
So I think I could go on, but I think we should probably draw things uh, to a close. Um, the event has been recorded and with Ron's blessing, of course, it will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Yes, Maya, did you want to just adjust? Oh, that's actually <laughs> indeed. Uh, thank you ever so much. Um, so yes, it will be uploaded onto the channel um, in a few days time. So spread the word. Those signed up who didn't actually attend, no doubt, will listen to the recording. Ron, thank you so very much and good luck thank with everything your new publications and I do hope we'll see an English language publication in the not too distant future and thank you everybody for being such a nice a nice audience all the very best thank you thank you thank good you. night good night thank you.